Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, here at lunchtime. Uh, my name is Gabe Scheinman. I'm the executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. I know, obviously, we have a lot of AHSers in the audience, so uh, hello to everybody there. Uh, and to a lot of Hertogers and AIers, um, uh, welcome. I'm sure you're all familiar with AHS, but uh, if you'd like to get more information about what we do on college campuses, whether in real life or virtually, uh, you can go to the website, alexanderhamiltonsociety.org. Uh, today's uh, uh, guest speaker, today's talk, uh, today's thinker, uh, it's a real honor uh, to have with us Professor Matt Kranig. Uh, as you can see from my background, I, I can actually point in the direction of, of what we're actually going to talk today. Uh, a very uh, nifty uh, thing here. Thank you to Zoom, uh, despite whatever we say about the, the PRC on, on today's call. Uh, uh, Professor Kranig is a professor of government and foreign service at Georgetown University, and also the deputy director in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Uh, his own research focuses on great power competition with China and Russia, uh, emerging technology, uh, strategic deterrence, and uh, nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, he has previously served in several positions in the US government at the Department of Defense and the CIA. Um, and he's the author uh, or editor of seven books, including, as I can kind of point to me right here, uh, his most recent book um, titled The Return of Great Power Rivalry, Democracy versus Autocracy from the Ancient World to the U.S. and China Today, uh, which just came out uh, about a month ago, I think, uh, uh, from Oxford University Press. Uh, so thanks, Matt, for joining us, and thank you all for being here. Um, uh, the format, as, as has been in past weeks, is that sort of Matt and I will kind of have a conversation for a, a few minutes, um, but then really open it up to all of you to ask questions. And so uh, if you could you feel free to submit your questions, even starting now, if you want to, even though we haven't said anything, uh, in the uh, Q&A function, uh, and that our uh, whole uh, team here between AHS and, and Hertog and AI uh, are co uh, collating behind the scenes, and, uh, and we'll get those to Matt when uh, we get forward. So uh, without uh, further ado, um, uh, Matt, um, your book is, you know, from my understanding is the central argument is basically that, you know, democracies are better than autocracies in great power competition. You know, it's sort of the, uh, sort of the, the transformer, you know, Autobots are better than the Decepticons, you know, demos are better than autos. Uh, obviously there's a lot more to that, uh, than a simple phrase like that. So maybe just to kick us off, maybe you can kind of, um, walk us through, uh, the argument that you're making, uh, the history that you've consulted, the research. Uh, that you've delved into, uh, as well as sort of, you know, how it pertains to the situation we find ourselves in today. Yeah, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Gabe, uh, for that introduction and for hosting me today. Thanks also to Alexander Hamilton Society, uh, Hertog Foundation, uh, AEI, uh, great organizations. And um, among my affiliations, I'm also the one of the faculty advisors for Alexander Hamilton Society at, at Georgetown. So always very happy to uh, to uh, participate in these events. Um, so the, uh, the, this book, um, the question it uh, asks is, is which system uh, is better, democracy or autocracy, uh, as it relates to gaining international power and influence, prestige, great power competition. Uh, and uh, as we all know, the national security strategy says the return of great power competition with Russia and China is the foremost threat facing the country. Uh, and there seems to be a, a, something of a conventional wisdom that started uh, with the financial crisis and has picked up steam over the past uh, decade or so, uh, that um, China uh, has the better system, uh, that the state-led capitalist model is more efficient than America's open market democracy, uh, that the CCP can uh, put in place um, long-term strategic plans, BRI, Made in China 2025, uh, if the government wants to do something like make massive investments in technology, they can pull a lever and get it done. Uh, meanwhile, in, in the United States, we've got this fractious democracy. It's polarized, gridlocked. We can't get anything done. Um, and you've even had people like uh, Thomas Friedman at the New York Times uh, write columns saying, um, wouldn't it be nice to be China for a day? Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could you know, put aside um, these democratic institutions and have a government that could pull a lever and, and get things done? Uh, and so, as uh, you point out, I uh, argue against that in the book and say this conventional wisdom is wrong and that ac actually democracies um, have a lot of strengths in uh, great power competition. Um, and autocracies have some as well, but I think those are outweighed by their vulnerabilities. So the book really has three parts. Um, the first is uh, kind of political uh, theory, political philosophy, because uh, this is a debate that really started with Aristotle, uh, which kind of political constitutions are better, 
Uh, and there are some heavyweights on both sides of this uh, debate. Uh, Machiavelli is one of the people I uh, cite who uh, maybe surprisingly to some argues that actually democracies or um, more specifically Republican um, constitutions are better for gaining uh, international power and influence. Uh, on the other side, you have people like uh, Alex, uh, uh, de Tocqueville who thought that autocracies were better. Um, so I lay out the advantages and disadvantages of both, but argue that democracies have uh, some really uh, significant advantages. Um, they tend to have better economic institutions that allow for longer term uh, or higher long run rates of economic growth, economic innovation, trade, um, better financial systems. Um, they tend to be better alliance builders, uh, tend to have more soft power, uh, tend to be better at amassing power without frightening their neighbors and causing counterbalancing coalitions. Um, and in military matters, they, um, because they're more innovative, often outcompete autocracies when it comes to high-end military technologies. Um, and they have the luxury of not um, repressing their own people. They can actually use their security forces to focus on the enemy. Um, and, and they tend to make better decisions on war and peace. Uh, you know, we've seen autocracies repeatedly invade Russia in the winter, um, something that democracies, uh, despite our uh, mistakes, don't tend to do. Um, and then the second part of the book is the history looking at seven autocratic versus democratic great power rivalries, starting with the Greeks and the Persians 2,500 years ago uh, and coming forward uh, through the end of the Cold War. Um, and so um, these case studies don't show that democracies always win, but it does show that they um, do pretty well and tend to outcompete their autocratic rivals for some of the exact reasons uh, I talk about in the theoretical um, framework. Um, so I look at uh, the Greeks against the Persians, the rise of the Roman Republic, uh, the Venetian Republic against its rivals, uh, the Dutch Republic against the Spanish Empire, um, Great Britain against France, and then uh, the United Kingdom against Germany, uh, and then finally uh, the Cold War. And then the third part of the book, and the part that's maybe most interesting to uh, most, is what does this mean for international politics uh, today? And so I look at the U.S.-Russia-China competition through this lens. Uh, and Russia is kind of an easy uh, case for me. Uh, it has a lot of the uh, typical um, downsides of autocratic systems in terms of its economy, uh, its inability to build alliances. Um, United States, I think, is an easy case for me. The United States uh, remains the world's largest, most innovative economy, the center of the global financial um, uh, system. Uh, a large network of alliances together with its allies, uh, the United States and its partners make up over 60% of global GDP, uh, and I think the world's most effective military. Uh, so the one that's more tricky is China. You know, many people do see China as this accept, uh, a successful example of state-led capitalism, and they have achieved quite a lot over the past uh, several decades. Uh, but if my uh, kind of framework is right, then we should see that this autocratic system uh, should constrain Chinese potential, and I think we're seeing that already. Um, uh, unwillingness to reform because of their autocratic system is constraining their economic growth, uh, which um, you know was negative this quarter, but had been trending downward for some time, um, uh, making it hard for them to build alliances and makes their actions provoke counterbalancing coalitions, and I think we are seeing uh, greater pushback against China. Uh, and then also uh, constraining its military potential. And a lot of examples here, but the most um, obvious one is China spends more on uh, domestic security than on its military. Um, so if you just follow the money, China is more afraid of its own people than it is uh, of the Pentagon. Um, so then I conclude by talking about what this means for theory and, and practice. Uh, in terms of IR theory, I think this presents a kind of hard power case uh, for democracy. You know, we often praise democracy because it protects freedom and human rights, and, and it does that. Um, but it also, I think, is the best machine ever invented for generating enormous power and wealth uh, on the uh, international stage. Um, and then in terms of um, policy, um, conclude that the United States, uh, despite all the declinism, is likely to remain the world's leading uh, power. Um, our institutions are our greatest source of strength. Um, and that um, Russia and China um, are, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to trade places. I, I, I think they have some real problems that they're struggling with. Uh, and then so I go on to provide some more um, specific recommendations about how the United States can uh, strengthen its already strong position. But I, I know we want to have a discussion, and I know there are a lot of smart people listening in, so maybe I'll conclude my opening remarks there and, and look forward to, to the exchange. Thanks, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. So let me start off with a, a couple questions about, uh, again, about, about ourselves, about the nature of kind of democracies. So 
Um, your book spends a lot of time talking about the importance of institutions and the differences between small d or small r democratic republican institution and those that we find in autocratic states, even though, as you talk about, there are obviously vast differences you know, within each of those categories. So could you talk a little bit about, uh, has your research shown, does the nature of the institutions within democracies uh, make a difference in a variety of ways? You know, the, the U.S. has a strong but limited executive. You know, in France, the head of state is virtually supreme. Uh, obviously, uh, the British system is, is a far more weaker leader. Um, if you could talk a little bit about just um, how those differences kind of play out or how you've seen them play out in history, especially as the nature of democracy obviously has evolved uh, since your you know, kind of initial foundational look uh, uh, in terms of ancient Greece. Yeah, uh, great question. And um, I think the big uh, difference within uh, democratic types that I talk about is the difference between um, democracy in terms of direct democracy, where all citizens are participating and voting on, on every issue, and then uh, Republican uh, systems where there are uh, checks and balances uh, within the system between various parts of governments, uh, strong protections for um, uh, minority rights. And so really the book is, uh, it's about, we say it's titled democracy and autocracy. Those are the terms we commonly use, but it's really about the advantages of Republican uh, forms of uh, government. And I'm not the first one to uh, draw this distinction. Machiavelli, Polybius, Montesquieu, a lot of uh, these classical thinkers um, uh, thought that Republican systems had many advantages, uh, but they saw downsides in direct democracy um, uh, that, of the kind that Athens had. Uh, and, you know, Athens, um, I think, became remarkably powerful and influential in the ancient world be because of its um, open system. Um, uh, but it also had this downside of direct democracy and this decision to invade uh, Sicily and the Sicilian expedition, which was really the beginning of the end of Athens and its uh, war uh, with Sparta. Um, and so I agree with Machiavelli and others that it's, it's really Republican uh, forms of uh, government. Uh, you know, it would be interesting. I didn't um, go beyond and, and think about uh, what are the differences between presidential versus uh, parliamentary. Um, and um, this is something that's happening in the broader political science literature, as you might know. There was an interest in democracy versus autocracy uh, for, for many years, and I build on a lot of that research in this book. Um, now there are scholars going uh, beyond and saying, well, there are different types of autocracy. You know, how are juntas different from single party states, different from dictatorships, uh, and how are, you know, uh, different types of uh, uh, democratic systems, uh, how do they vary? So that could be an interesting area for fu uh, future research. So it's, it strikes me from what you're talking about, and I, I know you're typically not a, you know, butter not guns kind of guy, but uh, it strikes me that, you know, if we were to look at this competition between ourselves and, and, the, and the PRC, that you know, you might say that the center of gravity, at least for ourselves, actually could be democratic decay. Uh, that if our own democratic institutions are challenged from within, whether that is corruption, decadence, despair, crisis, accumulation of power, I mean, all, all of the things that uh, Alexander Hamilton and others in the Federalist Papers warned about even from the early days, uh, that that actually could be the true threat to our world position. So how do you, you know, what do you think of that kind of contention? Um, what are things that, you know, where do you think we stand today on some of those issues? And, um, you know, are you worried or less worried? Yeah, great question. So I, I do see, uh, you know, often when people talk about America's advantages and foreign policy, uh, people talk about our strong military or our alliances. Uh, and I actually think that the root cause of our power is our uh, institutions. Uh, and that we have an innovative uh, large economy because of our institutions. We have uh, these alliances uh, because of our institutions. We have an effective uh, military because of our institutions. Uh, so I think that protecting America's Republican uh, form of government is key to our continued um, success. And in fact, I talk in the book about how some of these uh, kind of dominant uh, Republican systems, uh, countries have fallen in the past. And, and one of the ways is that they do change their institutions. Uh, and become less open, more um, uh, oligarchic or autocratic, and that leads to their decline. Um, so the Roman Republic is an example I, I talk about, and I'm not the first one to make this argument that Rome rose on the basis of its Republican institutions, but after the switch to uh, empire, it began, began its decay. Uh, the Venetian Republic, I think, is another uh, good example. It became more oligarchic, limited upward mobility, and that um, led to the, the decline of the system. Um, so in the conclusion, I, I say that, um, you yeah, know, this is the number one recommendation. Great power competition with Russia and China is 
uh, less about them and, and more about ourselves uh, and making sure that um, uh, we uh, you know, get our house in order at home, uh, that we're strong enough to compete. Um, so I do think that um, strengthening and maintaining our Republican form of government uh, is important. I, I think I'm also, and I talk about this in the book, somewhat more optimistic about uh, where we are there than other commentators. You have heard people talking about um, you know, the decline of democracy in the United States, how democracies die. Um, and I, I, I think actually um, our, our institutions remain um, pretty strong. And I think, you know, talk about Trump becoming a dictator. Uh, we, we've seen this before. People worried George Washington was becoming a dictator. People worried that uh, George Bush was forming an imperial presidency. Um, so I think that's uh, a sign that our system is alive and well. We see this knee-jerk anti-statism in, in the U.S. system. And I think that's a sign of strong uh, Republican institutions. Um. Great power competition, obviously, we, it's, it's easy for us to think about it in terms of war, right? But the vast majority of it is actually not war or, uh, frankly, avoiding war or between wars, uh, different ways to phrase it. Um, do you think there's a difference? I mean, and there's a lot of, uh, of evidence in the literature about democracies, you know, uh, are better at fighting war than democracies because they're more selective about what they choose to fight and then, and then how they fight it. But um, do you sort of see a difference in terms of how democracies uh, compete better or worse uh, with autography, uh, uh, autocracies, whether it's in war versus trying to avoid war or, or in between the wars. Um, it seems like, you know, uh, you know, the last five, six years, we've had this kind of popular gray zone uh, uh, competition, uh, which is sort of, you know, really kind of in the middle of that, but ordering more on the war side, let's say, uh, than the total peace side. But um, do you feel like the United States or democracy as a whole are better prepared as a consequence of their institutions for one type or one nature or one element of the competition versus another? Yeah, great um, question. So um, uh, in the book, I say in order for a country to be uh, powerful uh, on the world stage, in order to do well in great power competition, uh, it needs to be strong economically, uh, diplomatically, and militarily, and then kind of go through um, each of those three um, types and, and sources of power. So you're absolutely right. Uh, military, it's not all about military power and war. The economic uh, power is important. The diplomatic uh, power is important. And when it comes to the military um, matters, and as, as uh, you know, one of the nice things about writing this book is it, it's so broad, I was able to stand on the shoulders of giants and draw on a lot of existing uh, research. And so, as, as you point out, there's been a lot of research in international relations uh, recently about whether democracies are more likely to win the wars that they fight. Um, and, and the answer uh, empirically is that they are. They win something like 85% of their wars. Uh, one of the reasons is that because there's a free flow of information, they tend to uh, select wars that they can win. Uh, and so, um, you know, um, uh, much of this research focuses on, on recent examples, but it was interesting doing this deep historical research and seeing autocracies uh, kind of making these bad decisions uh, to launch major wars uh, in the past. Um, you know, so Xerxes uh, invading the Greeks and losing, um, again, uh, Hitler and Napoleon invading Russia and, and winner. Um, so so uh, democracies also uh, sometimes choose to fight wars that they lose, you know, arguably the United States and, and Iraq um, or Vietnam, but they don't tend to be uh, these disastrous uh, losses that result in you know, the collapse of their country and, and, and regime. Um, and then there's also some um, research on how uh, democratic soldiers may be more effective on the battlefield. Um, uh, because they're given the leeway to take initiative on the battlefield, uh, whereas uh, autocratic soldiers, uh, it's safer to wait for uh, orders from above than to, you know, freelance and, and get in trouble for disobeying orders. Uh, but on, on gray zone, that, uh, that's interesting. You know, the character of warfare is changing. And, um, you know, there are a lot of different gray zone um, activities. Uh, and I think it does point to one area where democracies uh, have a weakness and autocracies uh, have a strength. I think democracies are more open to outside influence uh, operations. And I think uh, we saw that all the way going back to the Greeks and the Persians and uh, the trespass of the, uh, or the uh, Greek shepherd um, uh, giving the information about the uh, secret pass to, to the Persians. Um, uh, and, and to today, Russian and Chinese um, disinformation penetrating our society. So I, I you know, I'm not um, Pollyannish. I, I think I recognize in the book that democracies have some weaknesses, autocracies have um, some strengths. Um, but, but the other point I would make here is I think democracies are more resilient to this type of uh, outside um, uh, you know, disinformation. Uh, we're already so awash in information. I think it's hard for Russia and China to really um, uh, tilt the scale one way or the other. Uh, 
Uh, whereas the autocracies know that they're brittle. Uh, and they know, you know, the Chinese try to protect information with the Great Firewall and uh, other things because they know if outside information gets in, the CCP uh, could be in real uh, and in real danger. Uh, and in fact, of these seven case studies that I look at, um, five of the seven result in autocratic regime collapse at the end in, in one way or another. Um, so that's one of the takeaways uh, for me that I, you know, I always kind of knew these autocratic systems were uh, brittle. Um, but I, I didn't realize what, how uh, common of a theme that was going to be until I until I did the research. So to just pick up on that point, um, you know, your argument is about institutions or, or systems or regimes in a lot of different way. Um, is it also, you know, how do you account for leadership, right? So Xi Jinping, you know, I, I'm, it's not that I'm a specific uh, scholar of, of China, but a lot of people have talked about how Xi Jinping is just a, a different leader than than his predecessors, than Hu Jintao. Or Wang Jinmin, right? And we can all agree that President Trump is vastly different from President Obama, who's vastly different from President Bush. And yet the system that spit, you know, the respective systems that spit those out, those leaders out in, in kind of the same way. Um, how, does, how does the individual decisions taken by leaders um, make a difference when, you know, if the argument is about institutions? Yeah, great question. Um, and, and I do think um, leadership matters uh, quite a bit. And we've seen some remarkable uh, examples of uh, leadership through history. Churchill is, you know, uh, one leader that I think many of us uh, admire. Um, and, and so it matters quite a bit. Um, but I also think, um, and one of the things the book tries to emphasize is that leadership is constrained uh, by institutions. Uh, and, um, you know, in um, autocratic systems, um, I think leadership matters uh, more because the leaders are, are less constrained. Um, and so, um, you know, I think one of the counterintuitive findings of the book is we often hear that uh, China can plan for the long term. Aut autocracies are good at strategic long term planning. Uh, democracies aren't. We're focused on the two year election cycle. Um, and actually, I came away with the opposite uh, conclusion. Since uh, dictators are unconstrained, they can jerk their countries in one direction and then back again uh, pretty easily. We saw that with Mao Zedong. Um, and then I think we're seeing that in the, now again with President Xi. Um, he's uh, really going back on a lot of the things that made China successful over the past couple of decades, uh, going away from a more consensual decision-making process, um, undermining, backtracking on Chinese economic reforms, uh, being more aggressive in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and I think this is going to um, turn out poorly uh, for them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Trump is an unconventional leader as well, as, as you point out. Um, but I think he has been um, constrained by um, American institutions and by the kind of uh, success of America's uh, long-term uh, strategy. And, and just one example, uh, you know, Trump has been so critical of NATO, um, yet NATO has continued to grow uh, under his leadership. North Macedonia and Montenegro joined the alliance, uh, you know, under this um, supposedly anti-NATO uh, um, president. So I think leadership matters, but it, it matters much more in autocratic regimes because they're, they're less constrained. So la last uh, question for me before I, uh, I start going to our audience questions. So um, you're looking at the cases you looked at are, are countries that were already on their way to becoming great powers or already great powers already in a, a sort of competition. Um, how do you count or, or what are your thoughts or where is your research on for those that haven't quite gotten there, right? So let's, let's use an example. You know, today's a, a variety of European states, you know, or the EU as a whole. Uh, certainly democratic, uh, certainly wealthy uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, many would say influential, others maybe not, but many would say influential. Uh, but clearly not great powers or certainly not uh, in the way that we think about it otherwise. Uh, is there a missing ingredient here? Is there a special sauce that um, has made things a little bit different for certain countries. And I'm sure I could point to the autocratic side of the ledger uh, in, in similar ways, right? I mean, the China of today uh, is not the China of 1949 or 1960. You know, things are not necessarily preordained uh, simply because uh, of a certain system. So how do you, how do you see those differences? Yeah, uh, great question. And this gives me uh, the opportunity to caveat the argument. Uh, you know, this is political science, uh, social science. It, it's not physics. So it's not that democracies uh, always become the world's leading power. Uh, autocracies always fail. Uh, it's that on, on average, uh, democracies tend to do better uh, than autocracies, and, and there are exceptions. Um, I would um, say, though, that, you know, one of the things that surprised me in doing the research is, because um, you know, one of the questions I had is, is it, um, there's a chicken and egg question. You know, does a country um, become democratic because it's growing and becoming wealthier and then it 
undergoes a transition to democracy? Uh, or does the democracy come first, and is that the wellspring of future power? And I do think it's the latter. And in fact, in many of the, uh, most of the cases I look at, uh, the country becomes democratic before it becomes a great power. Uh, you know, so Athens was one uh, small city state among many. It went under its transition to democracy and became a leader of the Greeks. Uh, you know, the Roman Republic started out as a small city state on the Tiber River and then uh, controlled the entire Mediterranean basin. Um, Dutch Republic, um, you know, went from being a, a small part of the Spanish Empire to overthrowing uh, the Spanish yoke, establishing its own global empire, the United States, a small smattering of British colonies turned into a global superpower. Um, so I do think it's the, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd push back on the idea that I looked only at great powers. I think some of these, you know, started quite small and then grew. Um, and then, so what does it mean for other democracies today? And um, it's one of the things I conclude uh, the book. Um, you know, some people think that China is going to overtake the United States as the world's leading state. And I argue that that's unlikely to happen so long as China's run by the CCP. Um, if um, China really wants to become a global power, it can give up. Um, you know, she can give up power and establish democratic institutions, but I think the CCP is unlikely to become the world's leading um, power. Um, so um, I, I say that if the United States is going to be overtaken, and I, I don't think the United States will, um, you know, just history shows, uh, you know, a primacy doesn't last forever. Um, so I think it's more likely that if China doesn't democratize, that it would be another democratic power that at some point um, overtakes the United States. So, uh, you know, looking around the world today, um, the EU, if it could ever get its act together and, and act as a single um, power, I think is possible. Hard to imagine that right now, but over the course of, I don't know, 50 uh, years, who knows. Um, India is, a, is another uh, possibility, um, you know, larger population than the United States, uh, world's largest democracy. Um, another um, uh, point I make kind of provocatively, and I'm not sure I believe it, but you know, we have seen these tiny democracies overthrow their autocratic overlords and establish global empires of their own. Uh, again, from um, you know, uh, the Venetians, uh, the, the Dutch, the, the Americans. Uh, and so I say maybe uh, Taiwan actually has a brighter future as a great power than uh, China. Um, it, its institutions are certainly uh, better suited for the task. You've, uh, you've, you've set up a little bit, being Chi, a little bit of a catch-22, which is, uh, you know, uh, democratize China and maybe the U.S. will get eclipsed, but, you know, it'll be okay because we're democrat everybody's democratic. Don't democratize China uh, and we'll stay top dog, but, you know, uh, kind of against our nature. So uh, anyways, let me let me turn to some of the questions and um, just because there's a number, I think, kind of the same point, let me kind of combine uh, a question from Zane Zovac and uh, Albert Vidal, uh, which is kind of twofold, which is the first is, uh, how much does interaction with rivals determine the success of the regimes, whether it's autocratic or democratic, um, you know how much you know. It's kind of another question of how much does their learning uh, from the other side, how much is their exploiting uh, from the other side um, in different ways, um, and that kind of combined a question, which is um, how do how can they uh, how do these states, I guess, implant themselves uh, in different ways to actually suck up a lot of information? I mean, obviously, a lot of what the uh, PRC is doing today is to um, compete with us. I mean lie, cheat, steal in a variety of ways. But, you know, part of that also is just to just get better. Um, you know, it, it happens to be weakening us, but it's also about kind of getting better, which is not that different than we or other democracies, let's say, have done in our history. So I guess, what is, how do you assess the interaction between rival regimes or rival systems in terms of how they learn from each other or don't learn from each other? It's a, a good question, and I'll come to that. I, I did want to pick up on your point about the uh, dilemma in U.S. policy toward China, and it's actually one of the things that got me interested in researching uh, this book a few years ago, is I was talking to some colleagues uh, and asked them, um, you know, pe people who've been watching China for a long time, and I said, what is the goal of U.S. policy uh, toward China? Uh, and uh, these uh, colleagues I was talking to said, well, well, the goal is, um, you know, regime change. It's um, end of the CCP democratization. And I said, okay, well, is that the goal or is it to maintain, you know, U.S. leadership, U.S. primacy? Uh, and they said, well, it's both. You know, they'll democratize and then the U.S. will remain the leading state. And, and I said, well, I'm not sure that's true. Actually, a, a liberal democratic China might be a more formidable competitor in some ways. It wouldn't have to fear uh, economic reforms and so could put in place more liberalizing of forms that, the reforms that make China more effective economically. Uh, 
Uh, it would have more soft power on the international stage, could build more effective alliances and partnerships, uh, wouldn't have to spend so much, so much of its security apparatus repressing its own people, uh, could focus more on foreign affairs. Uh, and so I, I do think that there is a, maybe a dilemma uh, in U.S. policy that, um, you know, we can have a dysfunctional, autocratic, uh, threatening China um, that's a middle tier power. Um, or we could have a liberal democratic China that maybe overtakes um, the United States as the world's leading state. And, um, you know, different people might uh, rank those things in, in different ways. I, I certainly have uh, my preference, but, um, you know, it's debatable. Um, on um, the interaction between uh, the countries, that's a, a great question. I think it's very relevant for the United States and China today, because uh, I think a lot of China's success has been parasitic on uh, the United States and this U.S.-led um, system. Uh, and the United States and, and this U.S.-led rules-based system, I think, has been, uh, China's been one of the greatest beneficiaries. It's uh, had geopolitical stability in Asia because of U.S. alliances. Um, it's been able to get rich because of the open uh, trading system that it was kind of willing, willing or able to uh, prey off of. Um, and it's a leader in technology today because it's parasitic on U.S. Uh, technology. Most of China's best technologists were trained in the United States. Um, there's a lot of collaboration between China and um, Silicon Valley. Uh, and so I think the United States was willing to allow that to happen because we had this hope that China was going to reform and become a responsible stakeholder. Uh, and now um, the United States has um, recognized that that's not working, that they're going in the opposite direction. And so we're taking this more competitive approach. Uh, and so I think this is, um, you know, one of the other ways that these autocrats kind of clumsy uh, diplomacy eventually provokes counterbalancing coalitions. Uh, and China now has um, created, um, you know, its own, uh, the worst possible enemy in the current international system. The world's leading uh, power has declared China the number one threat to security. Uh, and so I think this is another reason we can expect that China won't do as well um, uh, in the future as it has over the past couple of decades. So, so let's let's pick up on that uh, point specific because there's a bunch of questions. So again, I'm, I'm combining questions from uh, Spike Deering, uh, Thomas Kenna, uh, Braden Helwig, uh, and I think Joe Pop. And it shows you a little bit uh, how important this question is, which is, um, do you think China, or at least this regime in China, is headed for collapse? Um, how does this end, right? I mean, you talked about um, in your book that uh, many of your case studies, the autocratic regime collapses from within, uh, uh, not an unusual case for much of human history uh, in a variety of ways. Um, is things different today because of the ability of states to control uh, information uh, and people in ways that they couldn't before? Or maybe, you know, human history isn't that different. Um, there's still a debate now uh, 30 years later about what really caused the end of the Cold War and what really happened to the Soviet Union. Um, uh, you know, but it, but it collapsed and some people say that's a fluke. Other people say, no, nope, you know, that's where it went and maybe it's a, a game plan for China. So maybe you can kind of sketch us out your thoughts. Like, what do you think is, are they headed for a collapse? Yeah, uh, great question. And, um, you know, this is, um, you know, again, something that I always kind of realized, but, um, became clearer doing the research, just how common autocratic regime collapse, uh, is how often these rivalries end in autocratic regime collapse. Uh, and it is a real weakness of autocratic systems. They don't have a, um, uh, a clear plan for leadership secession. Um, and, uh, you know, China and the CCP, um, after Deng Xiaoping, were moving towards something like a, a clear um, institutional plan for leadership secession uh, with the standing committee of the Politburo and then uh, one of them uh, being elevated. Uh, but I think President Xi has um, thrown that out the window with other things, uh, you know, changing the constitution so that he can be uh, potentially president for life. And so I think what that means is the only way Xi is leaving power is, is in a coffin. Uh, and so, you know, if or when he uh, or when he dies, uh, what comes next? You know, I, I think we had a, an answer to what would happen in China if uh, a leader died, you know, 10 years ago. Now, now I, I don't think we, we have the answer. Uh, and so I think President Xi has actually made China weaker by, uh, I think many people see him strengthening power and seeing that as a sign of China becoming stronger. I, I think he's weakening uh, the system by making it more um, autocratic. Uh, so um, what, what to say on this? I, 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 um, I think that uh, the CCP collapsing is uh, one um, uh, possible way that this uh, ends. And you know, 50 years from now, I'm pretty confident there's gonna be a republic in the United States uh, 50 years from now, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain the CCP is still going to be in power. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, 
people, uh, you know, the CCP has only been there for 70 years uh, or so. Um, uh, you know, it, it has, it's not that uh, long lived. You know, people for some reason think China has this continuous history, uh, 5,000 years of continuous civilization. Uh, if you look at that, though, it was pockmarked by re rebellion, revolution, civil war. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it is um, possible that um, you know, she has a heart attack and there's a civil war in China tomorrow uh, in a way that's just not possible in, in the United States. Uh, final thing I'll say on this is I do think it's possible for the United States to achieve its goals uh, in China, um, uh, with China, even if there isn't uh, a regime collapse. So, you know, I think you could imagine a CCP deciding, um, you know what, we We've tried this competition and it's futile. The United States and its allies are too strong. Um, you know, you do have autocrats that are um, fairly cooperative with the overall U.S.-led rules-based system. You know, Singapore is UAE and, and others. So I think you could imagine a, uh, not President Xi, but maybe a future generation of Chinese leadership deciding to be more cooperative with the U.S.-led um, system uh, and that the United States being satisfied um, with that outcome. Um, but um, yes, uh, the bottom line is, is I do think that um, the CCP is brittle and, and collapse is uh, one of the likely ways that this ends. So here's a question from uh, Michael Battaglia, and, and uh, I'll add a, a second part to it, which is um, how do we convince uh, third world policymakers that they are better off on our side, on our side of the U.S.-led international order? Um, there's obviously a lot out there about kind of competing investment designs and all the strings that the United States or European uh, partners put on receiving aid or investment, the Chinese do or don't, uh, in light of the COVID crisis, um, uh, because most Western investment is private, a lot of it has gotten pulled or stopped very quickly, whereas China's government, government backed, very different. Um, we've seemed to have seen, yes, there's a little bit of backlash, but lots and lots of governments, including our own allies, uh, whether that's Turkey is accepting uh, Russian missile defense system or uh, you know, Chinese One Belt, One Road going into the heart of Europe, including NATO allies, uh, uh, Huawei uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, it, it seems like our allies and the third world countries writ large are not are not, haven't read your book or, or aren't as open to your argument. So how do we, how do we win that competition, let's say, uh, for the hearts and minds of not only our own allies, uh, but also other countries around the world? Uh, great question. And, um, you know, I think the first thing uh, to say is, um, let's uh, first take a stock, uh, take a step back and take stock of uh, where we are and where they are. Uh, and I think often um, in the West, in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Pentagon in particular, and uh, I think this makes sense, we focus a lot on the adversary's uh, strengths and our weaknesses. Um, and I think we see China's making inroads in Italy. It's making inroads in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, this is concerning. Um, and indeed it is. Um, but I also think um, good strategy uh, also requires to think about what are our strengths and, and what are their weaknesses. Uh, and I think when you, when you think about it that way, it's, it's still the case that America's alliance structure is a great strength. Our soft power is a great strength. Um, the fact that we can amass so much power without uh, antagonizing others um, is a great strength. And I think those are all weaknesses of uh, uh, China. Uh, so yes, they're making uh, inroads, but if you look at alliance uh, structures and soft power overall, the United States is still in a much um, stronger uh, position. You know, China's only allies, North Korea, a formal ally, you know, our formal allies, 30 of the uh, wealthiest, um, best governed democracies on earth, uh, over 60% of global GDP. Um, so how do we um, um, you know, uh, uh, help these uh, middle powers or smaller powers uh, choose uh, the right side? Um, and so one thing I think is, is we can't allow China's, um, uh, uh, you know, China to be their own worst enemy. And I think we are um, seeing that, that countries are starting to wake up to the downsides of being too close to China. Uh, you know, after China seized uh, the support in Sri Lanka as part of Belt and Road uh, Initiative, you've seen more skepticism uh, among other uh, countries. Uh, we've seen Britain, after COVID-19, say that they're going to rethink their decision to allow Huawei. Uh, into their 5G networks. Um, and um, uh, so I think we are seeing a little bit of a pushback. Uh, but I think uh, uh, part of the way we do this is, is we do need to compete. And so I argue that our system's competitive, but we need to compete. And I think for too long, uh, we let China get away with things. But I think doing a better job of highlighting uh, uh, China's misdeeds, and I think Secretary Pompeo and others have been doing a much better job of this uh, in, in recent months. Um, and also uh, making it clear to our um, to other countries around the world that um, 
you know, deciding to do business with China isn't a decision about uh, who has the cheapest or best um, 5G networks, um, not about getting roads or, or ports built. It's, it's really a question, a more fundamental question about what kind of world uh, do you want to live in? Uh, you know, do you want to live in the world that the United States and its allies have uh, created over the past 70 years, uh, which isn't perfect? We made mistakes, but I think it's been better than uh, any other system that's ever been uh, 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 produced in the history of the world. Or, or do you want to live in a Chinese or, or Russian led system? And uh, if you want to know what that system looks like, look at how they treat their own people, uh, look at how they treat the countries and their spheres of influence um, currently. Uh, and um, I, I think that's going to be a persuasive argument uh, for, for many. Uh, two questions about uh, the situation we live in today about COVID, or, or as uh, my politically correct overlords would make me say, the COVID-19 coronavirus that originated in Wuhan, China, perhaps from a laboratory. But uh, question number one is from uh, Joseph Howard, which is, in what ways do you think the pandemic will affect the global balance of power between democracies and autocracies? Um, and kind of question 1A from John Sabella is, um, do you see either China or Russia scaling back their uh, foreign or military uh, interventions or initiatives writ large as a consequence uh, of, the, of their own efforts to deal with the pandemic? Yeah, great questions. And, um, uh, you know, and in researching this book, um, I, I do in, in the book talk about a couple of pandemics and how they affected great power competition in the past. And just kind of mentioned them in uh, passing, didn't realize how relevant uh, they would be. But, um, you know, one of the things that leads to Athens uh, downfall, in addition to the Sicilian expedition, is the plague uh, that hit Athens, wiped out something like 25% of the population, uh, killed their uh, most effective leader, uh, Pericles, um, and uh, contributed to their uh, fall to uh, Sparta. And then also the Venetian Republic was hit with repeated uh, bouts of the Black Plague. Um, uh, one of them came across on the Silk Road trading routes from China, uh, so they were also a victim of a uh, pandemic uh, from uh, China. Um, and in fact, the word quarantine comes from uh, those days. It's the Venetian uh, dialect for 40 days, which is how long people would uh, quarantine themselves um, if they uh, had the plague. Um, so I do think this pandemic could um, contribute to the rise and fall of great powers. We've seen it happen in the past. Uh, and so I think the question is who will be hit harder, uh, the United States or China, and uh, which side will recover more quickly? And I think that's an open question, but um, you know, one thing we have going in our favor here is that the United States has this um, uh, experience with cycles of boom and bust. We've been through this you know, once a decade, uh, really um, since the, the post-war era began. Uh, whereas um, China has had remarkable, remarkably steady um, rates of economic growth. It hasn't gone through this boom and bust cycle since the Deng Xiaoping reforms. Uh, so I think this is really their first um, attempt to deal with a crisis of this magnitude. First time they're uh, reporting negative uh, a recession since the 1960s. Uh, and so I, I think there is an, an open question of whether China will be able to deal with this. Also because their political model depends on the uh, you know, essentially this pact with the people, don't ask questions about politics and we'll promise um, economic growth and a better life for your children. Um, and so if they can't follow through on that second part, if Chinese growth rates really go to 3% or, or lower, um, does the, uh, does the uh, model start to un unravel? Um, so I think it will, will really matter, matter and um, uh, may not be a surprise. I, th I think the United States is in a stronger position to weather this uh, than the CCP. Uh, so two questions about, um, we can both call them technology in a different way. One from Zach uh, Gruev, uh, another from uh, Tate Becker. Um, so the, the first is, um, what role, and this is obviously given your own deep expertise on this subject, but uh, what role does uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence play in great power competition? This is not a new subject, obviously. Uh, given, given the, I mean, it's been there since day one, uh, obviously since they existed, but, um, you know, how does that impact whether one side can win, let's say, a competition or another? Um, and the second, which is obviously much more recent, which is how does uh, big data, whether that's uh, AI, uh, 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 fast computing, semiconductors, I mean, the list just going on and on, uh, how has that become a tool uh, that, you know, is it allow democracies to uh, win better or autocracies to win better? Um, you know, it seems like we're just like in the 50s and 60s, we're really at the cusp of a 
technological revolution when it came to the nature of warfare as a consequence of nuclear weapons. There are many people out there arguing that we're living through right now um, another technological revolution uh, in terms of the information revolution in relation to warfare as well. Yeah, uh, great questions. And, um, you know, uh, I, th I think you know, Gabe, that um, one of my main areas before writing this book was nuclear weapons. I've uh, thought a lot about nuclear weapons. Uh, and I thought I knew it all, but I, I learned some things about nuclear weapons by approaching it, approaching it through this democratic autocratic lens. Because uh, one thing I think we see consistently is that um, democracies uh, tend to do pretty well when it comes to um, new military innovations and technology in military affairs. I think this starts with the Greeks and the Persians. You know, the Persians had larger numbers, but the Greeks had better armor and longer spears. And, uh, and I think we have seen democracies outcompete um, uh, uh, democracies outcompete autocracies when it comes to um, uh, military technology. Uh, during the Cold War, of course, it was a major consideration. The Soviets decided they just couldn't compete with um, Reagan's ideas for missile defense and stealth and, and um, precision guided munitions. Uh, and when we look at um, nuclear deterrence um, today, um, and this is what was really surprising to me, I think often in the West we think um, that you know, having nuclear deterrence means having a second strike capability. You do that by putting nuclear weapons on submarines, primarily. You know, once you have nuclear submarines at sea, the enemy can't find them, they can't sink them. Um, but um, uh, really, it's only democracies who's, who've ever been able to figure this out. Uh, the United States, Britain, France do regular deterrence patrols with our submarines. Um, the Soviets tried it during the Cold War. Um, and I have some colleagues, Brendan uh, Green and Austin Long, who've written about this. Uh, but then the Americans got really good at tracking their submarines. So the Soviets went to a bastion strategy just keeping their submarines close to the Russian um, uh, uh, you know, uh, homeland. And then the US Navy got good at tracking them there. And then the Russians essentially kind of gave up and had nuclear weapons on submarines on dock alert, uh, you know, just sitting at the docks, which you know, kind of defeats the purpose of, of submarines. And then if we look at the uh, Chinese, they put their first nuclear submarine in the water in 1986. Um, still to this day, they don't do regular deterrence patrols with their submarines. Um, so they don't uh, have nuclear uh, weapons on uh, submarines out in the uh, blue waters. And um, uh, talking to some real China PLA experts, one of the things they've said is that part of the reason China does this is because they're an autocracy. Uh, they like strict uh, centralization and command and control. They have their nuclear weapons in central depots. Uh, the idea of giving nuclear weapons to junior military officers and sending them to sea, uh, you know, sounds crazy to them. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that's constraining both Russia and China's ability to have a, a survivable nuclear deterrent. Um, if you want to know where your enemies are weak, weakest, just ask them. Uh, and the, the Russians and the Chinese often complain that we're going for a nuclear first strike capability. I used to think that they were paranoid, but, but now I think that they uh, have real fears and, and justified uh, fears. Um, so I think if, you know, part of, I, I said before, part of competing is making ourselves better. Uh, but if we want a more competitive strategy that really goes after the enemy's weaknesses, uh, I think these are two of the big weaknesses, domestic regime and stability in both countries, um, and their ability to compete in these high-tech um, military competitions. Um, I think if we really wanted to invest in missile defense, hypersonics, um, other things, the, the Russians and the Chinese would have a hard time keeping up. And, and so on AI, I think the answer is the same. Many people now think that uh, China has the lead in AI. Uh, it has more data. Um, and I think that it does have, in certain applications, tracking its own population, facial recognition, um, does have advantages. Uh, but I think overall, the United States still has uh, more advantages. You know, the United States has been the world's leader in innovation since at least the time of Thomas Edison. Uh, and um, throughout the book, I show the big revolutions, uh, technological revolutions have almost always happened in democracies. You know, the first industrial revolution and second industrial revolution were in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, third Industrial Revolution, the Internet Revolution was in the United States. And so the question is, um, where will this fourth Industrial Revolution in AI and big data, where will this take place? Um, and, you know, some say it's going to happen in China, but I, I wouldn't, uh, I would bet uh, on, on the United States. So one of this, this question comes from Jack Baer, um, and I'm going to add a second part to it. So you mentioned that democracy's prudence when picking which wars to fight and how to fight them is inherently a strength. Um, and this partially comes from uh, accountability to citizens, both needing to sort of be transparent about uh, the reasons why to go to war, but also the costs that are associated with it and um, a sometimes war-weary public that has to bear the burden. Um, 
to what extent does a political will, let's say, which some might argue is weakening uh, in the United States, uh, but to what extent does political will uh, matter um, in great power competition? Um, we usually talk about this just in terms of democracies, but as you point out, autocracies have you know, what are known as audience costs uh, as well. Uh, and, and those could be uh, in some ways uh, more costly because they can move their, lose their heads. Uh, so uh, can, can you talk a little bit about the nature of political will um, in this fight? Yeah. Well, I mean, a, f a few thoughts. You know, this, is, uh, this was a fun book to write, and I hope people enjoy um, reading it. Uh, but it, it is a kind of a book that, you know, a single variable explains all of uh, human history. And so it really does zero in on the institutions and how do those matter. And I, I think they matter um, immensely. Um, but they're not the only things that matter. And, you know, if I were writing a more, um, uh, a longer um, book, it would, probably would talk more about leadership, about political will and other things. Um, but I think, um, you know, in, in the United States, at least, there, there needs to be the, uh, the will to compete. And I think in the early days of the Cold War, there were uh, some questions about America's motivation. Uh, and it took uh, Sputnik and uh, the Soviet lead um, uh, in launching the first satellite uh, that made many Americans uh, wake up the Sputnik moment that led us to really decide that we're going to do this, make investments in science and technology and, and beat the Soviets. Um, and I, th I think we quite ha maybe haven't quite had our Sputnik moment with China yet. I think the national security community recognizes the threat. I think many of our political leaders are increasingly recognizing it. I'm not sure the American public um, has uh, recognized it yet. So I do think it might take a, a Sputnik uh, moment for us to decide, you know, this really is an overriding national priority. Uh, do, maybe you, do, you, do you think that COVID is a Sputnik moment? I mean, do you think that's worth it or, or are people not seeing it in those uh, terms or through those lenses? I, I was just going to say, maybe this is uh, the moment. I think it might be too early to tell. Um, I saw yesterday that my home state of Missouri uh, was the first state to file a lawsuit against uh, China for damages. Uh, caused by uh, coronavirus. So if, uh, you know, the governor of uh, Missouri um, sees China as a threat, uh, maybe we are um, starting to get there. Um, um, yeah, so um, I think maybe I'll end it there. Okay. Um, there's a couple questions that have to do with kind of interplays in different things. So question from Daniel Samet on uh, what should Washington do about the emerging uh, Sino-Russian rapprochement uh, similarly, uh, another question about, um, you know, how does the United States compete with China when it also has autocratic allies, uh, for that matter? Um, and obviously during the Cold War, we had quite a number. Um, so it's not such a simple dividing line between, you know, the democracies on one side and the autocracies on another. Um, it's more complex. And, and, you know, we've also talked about the Russians have kind of made inroads in uh, parts of their former uh, Soviet empire in a variety of ways that, while maybe trending in the wrong direction, still might be considered democratic today. Yeah, um, great question. And this is something that uh, is kind of a central theme of, of uh, the book. And i um, been thinking about writing a, a spinoff piece just on the Russia-China alliance, because uh, many people are uh, concerned about this now. We saw the director of national intelligence uh, last year say that uh, Russia and China are working more closely together than at any time since the 1950s. Um, you have many people in, uh, you know, they're conducting military exercises together. Um, and you have uh, some people in Washington uh, channeling their inner Kissinger and saying, you know, in the 70s, we worked with China against Russia. Now we need to do the reverse. We should work with Russia uh, against China. So I understand those arguments, but I'm uh, uh, skeptical. And the main reason I'm skeptical is I think autocrats aren't good at building alliances. Uh, they aren't good at building trusting security partnerships. Uh, so if we just look um, historically, even just at Russia and China, uh, they had an alliance uh, in the 1950s, and then they nearly fought a nuclear war with each other uh, in the 1960s. Um, Russia, uh, the Warsaw Pact, uh, the Warsaw Pact's major military action was against its own members. Uh, you know, Russia had to invade Hungary and um, uh, Czech Republic to put down uprisings. Uh, and so um, autocrats fight with each other uh, almost uh, more than with the enemy. Um, so I'm less concerned that Russia and China are going to, I think they could cause some damage, so we shouldn't dismiss, dismiss it altogether. Uh, but I think it's unlikely that they work together in a coordinated, trusting fashion uh, against the United States. And so for that reason, I think it's not really um, necessary to work with Russia against China. Um, I think their systems are weak enough and we and our allies are strong enough that we can beat them both at the same time.
So let me, we're, 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 running, uh, we're running out of time, uh, but and I'm gonna take the prerogative of asking the kind of last question and really put you on the hot seat, which is, uh, let's say the president reads your book, uh, which may be a big if, or maybe he's, he, he watches this uh, one hour or many of the other book talks you, you've done, um, and you have an opportunity to kind of make your argument uh, to him uh, in terms of you know, what your, your research in through uh, you know, 2,500 years of human history uh, has given, uh, where the United States stands on it, the fact that the national security strategy and our national defense strategy have certainly put this front and center um, and, and, and seems to have uh, actually moved the needle in Washington a variety of ways on it. Um, if you could tell him you know, the three things based on your research that you feel like we as the United States or his administration is not doing a good enough job on when it comes to the great power competition, uh, what would they be? Well, first I um, um, would give the president uh, some credit here. I think um, it did, um, uh, his administration was the, the first to recognize and the, the challenge that China poses and take concrete steps uh, against it. You know, I think the, the trade war, I wouldn't have gone about it in exactly the same way, but I do think that took uh, courage to take China on uh, for its um, uh, you know, predatory economic practices at, at an economic cost to the United States, but I, I think we do need to take China on. I think the, um, my, my message to, to uh, the president is I, I'm not sure that he um, kind of understands the, the U.S. grand strategy over the past 70 years that I think has been so successful. Uh, and again, people say it's China with the grand strategy and we don't have one. We need a strategy. Uh, I would say um, we've had a strategy for the past 70 years. It's been uh, building this rules-based international system, uh, you know, providing security in important regions like Asia and Europe, uh, creating international institutions, uh, encouraging countries to work through those institutions, um, making, uh, uh, promoting open market uh, systems uh, at home and a globalized world, uh, promoting democracy and good governance. Uh, and I think this has been a remarkably successful system for the world and, and for the United States. Uh, and so I think this um, grand strategy uh, can continue to work for us. There's no reason to throw it out the window. I think it should be revitalized and adapted uh, for a new era. Uh, and I think that's the way we're, uh, we can beat uh, Russia and China, by not um, doing anything um, drastically different, but by sticking with what's worked for us uh, for the past 70 years. And, and so I think, um, you know, um, Yes, we have some differences with our allies and you know, Athens had differences with uh, its allies. I, I think there are um, you know, disputes within alliances, uh, but I think we should um, put the disputes with our allies uh, on the back burner and focus our shared attention on uh, China. Um, you know, the European Union, Japan have many of the same concerns that we do with uh, Chinese economic practices. Uh, and if we combine uh, forces, we're gonna be much more uh, effective. Again, we can combine 60% of world GDP against China's 13% if we're aligned. If we include other democracies, not just formal allies, that's 75% of global GDP. So I think many people are pessimistic about where we are. They say we don't have the power uh, we had in the past, but I think especially if we com combine with allies and like-minded states, uh, we do have the preponderance of power really to do um, uh, uh, quite amazing things, uh, defeating China and uh, revitalizing uh, this US-led system for a new era. You're giving us a lot of hope in, uh, in, in dark times for all of us here. So I thank you for that. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, uh, Matt Kranig. Uh, congratulations uh, on the book. I, I guess I'll point uh, Great Power Rivalry. Uh, maybe if one of my colleagues actually can put literally the Amazon link in the chat feature. And so uh, almost like kind of a one-click ordering for, for uh, all of you uh, here in this call. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, buy the book, read it, uh, write reviews, share with friends. Uh, um, it's a... a on the one hand, probably a difficult time to be an author. On the other hand, uh, hopefully a lot of people have a lot more time uh, to, to, to read uh, and, and watch things. So thanks all for joining us. Uh, be sure to tune in uh, for our next talk uh, next week. I think the informational will, will kind of go out shortly. So thanks everyone and hope everyone is uh, healthy, safe, and uh, as sane as you can be.